It's June 9th, 2010. Game six of the Stanley Cup final is taking place between the Chicago Blackhawks and the Philadelphia Flyers. They'll still have to win a game seven in Chicago. It's a 3-3 tie in the first overtime, meaning this has been a moderate offensive explosion with some decent defense and goaltending squeeze in between this hockey contest. This is a huge game for Blackhawks fans as their favorite hockey team has been a laughing stock in the Western Conference for most of the previous decade. For the Flyers, they're looking to bring back Stanley Cup glory to the city of brotherly love for the first time since the 1970s. To truly understand the importance of what happens next, we need to hit that left button on the VCR. In other words, we need to rewind. The Blackhawks are an overtime goal away from cementing their legacy in NHL history. But for a franchise who used to not even televise its home games, this seemed like a pipe dream even five years ago. Known for his severe cheapness, Blackhawks former owner Bill Wirtz decided to cancel all home broadcast agreements with network and cable television outlets in 1992. According to Wirtz and the Wirtz Corporation as a whole, home broadcasts were, quote, unfair to the team's season ticket holders, unquote. And as crazy as this decision was by Wirtz, fan attendance increased during the mid-1990s. Incredibly, without normal home broadcasts and overall television brand awareness about the team, the Hawks averaged over 19,300 fans during the mid-1990s at the United Center. This is how it worked. WGN and other media outlets couldn't broadcast the Blackhawks games at the United Center. But if a national broadcasting network such as ESPN decided to telecast the game, a Blackhawk fan could purchase Hawk Vision, a subscription network worth $29.99 per month. Then you could watch the ESPN broadcast of Blackhawks vs. Red Wings at the United Center on normal cable television. It was pretty confusing to be sure, and as you know, the internet wasn't big back then. If you were a big hockey fan and wanted to know about the Blackhawks, you either had to go to the game or wait for the hockey highlight on SportsCenter. Even then, hockey coverage wasn't big on ESPN, so it was in your best interest to purchase a ticket at the UC. So the fans kept supporting the Blackhawks even though they couldn't watch their favorite team on TV. However, the product on the ice wasn't so great. As if it were a curse from the hockey gods, the Hawks kept finding different ways to choke in the playoffs. An original six team, the Hawks were at one time the second most cursed original six franchise. The New York Rangers went titleless from 1940 until 1994, and the Hawks now find themselves in the same place as the Toronto Maple Leafs. The Maple Leafs and the Hawks have not hoisted Lord Stanley's Cup since the 1960s decade. For the Hawks, it's been even worse. They haven't won it all since 1961, and before that, Chicago went 23 years without hoisting the Cup. The Maple Leafs have been a borderline disaster since 1967, but at least the Leafs were a dynasty in the 60s. The Hawks were lucky to even win the 1961 Stanley Cup. So yeah, the Hawks have pretty much been mediocre or worse since 1961. However, there were moments when the franchise seemed destined for championship glory. The worst moment for Chicago hockey fans was the 1971 Stanley Cup Final against the hated Montreal Canadiens. Without air conditioning at Old Chicago Stadium, the Hawks were the home team during Game 7 of the Finals against the Canadiens. Jumping out to an early 2-0 lead, legendary netminder Tony Esposito couldn't stop Jock Lamar's 60-foot away snapshot, giving the Canadians their first goal of the contest. Chicago Tribune writer Bob Verde said there was a humid haze hung over the ice, but Esposito refused to blame the rink's lack of air conditioning on the soft goal he gave up. He had a point since Lamar's shot was nearly from the center line. The Canadians never looked back and scored twice more to upset the Hawks and win 3-2 on Chicago's home ice. Since then, the Hawks have never been closer to winning the Cup as they were that day in 1971. That is, until tonight anyway. As painful as it was in 1971, Hawks fans who were still alive in 1992 had to be devastated at what happened next at Belfour and Dominic Hasek. Incredibly, Eddie the Eagle, Belfour, and Dominic the Dominator Hasek were both on the Blackhawks at the same time. Two future Hall of Fame goalies were both on the Hawks, and yet the franchise still couldn't win a Stanley Cup with either netminder. Belfour was the starter during the brief Belfour Hasek years. The Hawks made the 1992 Stanley Cup championship round with Belfour and Hasek both on the roster. It was also a Chicago team with Chris Chalios leading the defenseman and forward Jeremy Roenick was on this Hawks team as well. Led by captain Dirk Graham, the Hawks went on a very impressive winning streak in the playoffs. After falling to a 2-1 series deficit to the St. Louis Blues, the Hawks won their next three games against the Blues, as well as back-to-back -back series sweeps against the Detroit Red Wings and the Edmonton Oilers. Just like that, 11 consecutive victories saw the Blackhawks four wins away from ending up as the last team standing. 
the only team in their proverbial way. The NHL's version of the Super Mario Brothers, otherwise known as Mario Lemieux and Yammer Yager. The Pittsburgh Penguins were the defending cup champions, and after nearly beating the Washington Capitals in Game 7 during Round 1, the Pens found their way in the finals thanks to winning 8 of their last 10 games. Hasek was probably Chicago's better goalie entering the playoffs, as the Dominator earned all rookie honors and went 10-4-1 during his 15 starts between the pipes. Between a contract holdout from Belfort and Crazy Eddie missing games this season due to personal reasons, Hasek was turning into a fan favorite, while Belfort was the more controversial choice in net. However, head coach and general manager Mike Keenan stuck with Belfort throughout the playoffs. He turned out to be the best cold ender in the postseason not named Tom Barrasso. The problem is Barrasso plays for Pittsburgh, so it was up to Roenick and company to find consistent offense against the Eastern Conference's best goalie. It looked like the Hawks had the Pens right where they wanted them when they took a 4-1 lead during Game 1. But the hockey gods haven't liked Chicago since 1961. Whenever the Hawks can blow a postseason lead during crunch time, they like to do it. The Pens scored four unanswered goals on their home ice, including the game winner with just 13 seconds left in OT. A crushing 5-4 loss for the Hawks, and they never rebounded from it. It was a sweep for the Pens as the Penguins celebrated their championship victory at Chicago Stadium. Hasek even showed during the series that he still had some raw rookie moments, but Belfair clearly wasn't himself. Hasek subbed in for Belfour in Game 4 after Eddie the Eagle gave up two goals on just four shots on goal. Keenan had a tough decision to make between keeping Hasek and Belfour, but with Belfour one year removed from winning the Vezina and Williams M. Jennings trophies for best goalie, Keenan had no choice but to allow Hasek to become expendable. The Sabres then cashed in on the young goalie's athleticism by fleecing the Hawks with a terrible trade request. The Sabres received a future Hall of Famer at Hasek, and the Blackhawks received just future draft considerations and a goalie in Stefan Beauregard, who never played a single minute in the goalie crease. The future draft considerations eventually led to the Hawks drafting Eric Daze in the fourth round. Daze became an all-star left winger, but serious back and herniated disc issues saw the team's promising winger limited to just 74 games in three seasons after his all-star game appearance in 2002. He retired after playing just one game in 2005. That being said, Keenan didn't want there to be a locker room controversy.
Now you're recording, right? Keep your eye on the clock at all times. Whatever they have, I want. This button starts the clock, right? Correct. Don't be late. Touch screen as well as clicking.
afternoon, everybody. Kyle Smith alongside Bob Vilsaway as it's the 15U CD CSDHL All-Star Game featuring the red team and the blue team. Well, the first game we told you about the uh, blue team uh, roster. Let's talk to you about the red team roster. For red, goalies going to be number one, Nico Sanello. Defenseman number two, Barrett Phillips. Number three, defenseman Trey Adams. Number four, defenseman Dylan Dawes. Number five, defenseman Owen DeSousa. Number six, defenseman Daniel O'Shea. Number seven, forward Anthony German. Number eight, defenseman Jackson Burgess. Number nine, forward Landon Porter. Number 10, defenseman Austin Maddich. Number 11, defenseman Nathan Jerzabak. Number 12, forward Kelby Zerzba. Number 13, forward Antoni Mirzwa, number 14, forward Justin Pappen, number 15, forward Jackson Conroe, 16, forward Charles Jackson, 17, forward Chase Magellan, 18, forward Michael Catalano, 19, forward Christian Reutberg, and between the pipes today, number 35, Logan Marsh. Well, the first one was exciting. It went to a shootout. They got their work cut out for them uh, in terms of the uh, the, uh, the encore performance. In terms of the excitement value, you got that right. That was great. We had three um, three on three skating during the five minute overtime. Then we had a shootout. Fantastic game. We had some fantastic saves. It's what you expect from an all star game, right? The scoring ended up being a six four final. The prediction today is four two for we'll say somebody. The interview beforehand, Ryan Cook predicted it would be four two in favor of the blue team. So it'll be Red picking it up. That'll be Burgess, and instead Blue has it. Right now it's Cook. He had three goals and two assists in the most recent postseason. Goalies to watch out for. Dane Simpson was fabulous in the postseason, 1.88 GAA. Now what was very interesting, the games did not look like 14-year-olds early on, right? They looked way older, stronger, faster, everything, and more in connection with each other. Now these are just 15s, right? But yet they look like a, like a semi-professional -prof hockey team out here. So the keys, they're going to have to break out of their own zone without getting four checked to death. There were a lot of odd man rushes early on, so there were some defensive breakdowns, a lot of pinching in by the, the defensemen at the wings, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. So it resulted in a lot of three-on-twos, a lot of two-on-ones. We had several breakaways. So the offense was definitely ahead of the defense in the earlier game. Out behind the net as it's played right now by Phillips and instead stolen away by Blue in the slot and then poked away by Red. Out near the faceoff circle, Red with it now at uh, past the center line with Porter. And it was picked up that time by Adams. Now over to neutral ice, sending it in is Adams and Adams will get a replacement on the ice. Nope, he's gonna stick at his spot. It looked like he was pointing to the bench that he was gonna get off the ice, but uh, that time Played uh, by Pope and then over to the faceoff circle after briefly was Flanagan now into the slot shot. Couldn't get it on net. Loose puck, backhanded, and a beautiful glove save. Able to stop the goal, the starting yeah. netminder for Blue. If he could have caught on to the handle, was, uh, he had to stretch a little bit for the backhand. If, it, if the, the stick had the puck on it, it probably would have been a goal because there's nobody between that stick and the puck and the net. But unfortunately, that little bouncy puck skipped over the stick and no shot. So we have a, a faceoff in our favorite little faceoff circle near side and to the right. Over to the faceoff circle, picked up by Red out in front, getting in the way that passing lane is blue. And good thing he did, because that was going to be a wide open shot. Cleared it out of the zone. Bouncing off the boards, and now past the blue line, tapped away, and it was to the stick uh, that time of Walk cop and now over to neutral ice now picked up by McQuillan over to the blue line Dawes with it sends it over to his defensive pairing and that might be a check from behind they're not going to call it now over to the uh, corner in the slot so tapped away that time so you want to throw a flag on the 15 yard clipping punt breakaway coming here we go breakaway making a two on oh now deeks out the net minor and a beautiful kick save glove the net falls off and <laughs> Play the, the player scored a goal, but no goal with the puck. So Caden Eyerts, who was not very good in the postseason, a GAA of 2.34, but he was very good on that deke. And not very good in the postseason with 2.34. 2.34 is very good. Yeah, it's not two. Oh, my. <laughs> you're a tough, was, tough was guy. A, it was a five-game sample size. Yeah, you're a tough crowd. I demand perfection of my players. If you don't... Uh, 
If you don't get perfection, no orange slices and juice boxes for you. That's right. You don't bat 350, you're done. No, but he was, he was fine, 2.34. But nothing compared to Dane Simpson at 1.88. I mean, you look at some of the other numbers. How about this partner? In the 16U game, which is after this one, Noah Ingersoll, guess what his GAA was in the postseason? 1.05. I mean, nobody can have 1.05, <laughs> 1.66. close. Noah Sanderson, 95.8 save percentage. So we got some really good goalies coming up in the later action today. Well, but it's going to be counteracted because we're going to have some really good all-stars shooting pucks at them. And we'll see how well the defense can block shots so that they can prevent a few opportunities. Out to the corner and then sent out behind the net. Now over to neutral ice, Stark plays it past the blue line. And we and can already see blue. the speed of the 15s over the speed of the 14s. Just wait till the 16s, then the 18s come up. We have live stats today, falling to the ice as blue team looks for a trip, but the ref says that it was a clean check and did not tug at the leg. Pappen had it briefly. Now over to Burgess, past the blue line. And Cook waved at it with his stick, and that's gonna be icing against blue. Well, partner, looked like Red was going to win in that 14-U game prior to this, but a late goal by the man we had in the pregame show, Dominic Pasoli, tied it up at three. Some excellent saves by Schoenholz to force the shootout, and then Schoenholz was just exhausted and couldn't get it done in the uh, shootout. Yeah, he gave up all three shots in the shootout. Good face-off win to Phillips on his shot attempt. It's blocked by Blue, bouncing off the boards on the stick of Cook, and then back over to neutral ice. Past the blue line, and a little tap pass that time off by Holmes. Ooh, that was fortunate. He had a blowout, but the puck was under him, so Red couldn't pick it up. Cook past the blue line with it. Cook, and he'll backhand it over to his teammate behind him in Feinstein. One hops off the boards. No look backhander. Beautiful pass by German, but not able to stay on side was Jackson Conroe. So we have a relative of the uh, Senator Feinstein on this team, huh? The other, there's another name that popped out on me. I'll have to go find her, where it was. Mishlek used to play volleyball with somebody named Mishlek. I wonder if the, there's a re relation there. Face off one by Feinstein and then sent over to Michalik. And then over to the face off circle. Little flip pass. It's tough, tough to handle on defense. That's why some uh, teams do that. You get the puck out and it's tough to retrieve on the opposite side. Meanwhile, Red, it bounces off the boards, picked up by Porter as he was trying to find his teammate in Mirzwa and then stolen away by Blue Cook. Rogers was after it. Here's a chance for Red, ill-advised line change. Porter will try to make him pay, and that puck was <laughs> loose. I mean, it didn't matter anyways, partner. Blue was going to get it and clear it, but... Well, exactly right. The, the referee saw the puck go right into the breadbasket of the goalie, blew the whistle appropriately, but then the puck kind of dribbled out behind him and was slowly headed toward the red line, all on camera, but then blue defenseman came in and swiped it. So it didn't cost anybody yeah. a goal. Probably shouldn't have been blown for a faceoff, but I mean, it is. It's actually more of a break for red because they get the line change they wanted. If they, had, if they had played on, blue was gonna clear it quickly and red could not get the line change. I mean, you could, it would just be an ill advised time to do a line change when uh, Blue's on a rush or past the center line. Well, it started out with an intercepted pass, right? So Blue thought they were making a safe defensive line change with both defenders at the same time. The puck was the, intercepted on this side, away from the benches where the line change was not happening. So sometimes that stuff happens. As Dawes gets it in deep, shot, he scores! So that shot went off the backboard, bounced in front of the net, unfortunately bounced right over the goalie stick into the middle, and it was an easy goal from the crease. I mean, that's why goalie's got to be quick from post to post if he had covered his post well. Even if it carried him straight forward, straight back from the, from the boards into play, if the netminder is quick on the play and able to go post to post, he should, he should be able to secure that. Goalie couldn't see it, goes right off the boards, right in play, and Jackson backhands it in. It's a garbage goal, but they all count. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm never saying there's a garbage goal, but it did bounce <laughs> over a stick into the slot and easy I goal. I mean, you can't get much of an easier goal than that. No, it's, you're, well, that's why you, you get right in front of the slot all the yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, like a little backhander that caroms off the boards, I call right. that a garbage goal. 
And I think if we interviewed Charles Jackson after the game, he would admit it's not one of his prettiest goals. <laughs> well, and, and obviously it would have been better if the goalie somehow could have smothered that puck off that back wall. But, you know, here it is, that frozen pipe, puck right on top of a, a frozen pile of water, and it bounces. And that's uh, right off the stick, no rebound try. That one's tough to take if you're a blue fan. But you know what? That's part of goal. That's part of hockey, right? You know, you know soccer gets the distinction of the beautiful game because every time you there's a huge hit, as it was delivered by Michael Catalano. You know, soccer gets the uh, distinction of being the beautiful game. You rarely get those off the shin of the goalie and then a rebound try for a goal. In hockey, a lot of the goals are rebounds and one of those weird bounces off the boards back into play. Well, and that's what you're hoping for. You're just trying to maximize your opportunity for a rebound, a redirect, a, a bad bounce. That's why. Uh, Coaches say, always shoot it. Walkopf. It's a nice German heritage last name, if I've ever seen one. Stark with it. Stark with some nice moves. Because it's an all-star game partner, you're not going to see any cheap shots, any boarding calls really today. Yeah, we had very few penalties in the first game, although oddly the penalties that did happen were both in overtime. Well, two of the three, I guess, penalties were in overtime. And then the other penalty was late in the third period. And yeah, Stark can't keep it in. So Jackson with the lone goal thus far. And very early goal. Yeah, as there was a chance briefly for Shrout, but he couldn't score. And That's what you're supposed to do on the far side, though. Shoot it low off the far leg. Look for the rebound on the far side. If it caroms, car caroms perfectly, you've got a goal. Yes. Oh, huge hit. Now, did he leave with the leg? The linesman says no when we play on. And, you know, if you look at the stats brought to you by CSDHL.org, it's kind of a shame that we're not going to see Manini in this All-Star game. He had a fabulous year, 29 goals, 43 assists, and he scored seven of those goals on the power play. And how about this partner? Manini had 17 power play assists. And that's another goal for Red. They keep peppering the net minder and they keep capitalizing with goals. Again, a, sh a, a pass this time from behind the net and then pushed it into the upper shelf, you know, top shelf to the goalie's right, to our left. So they're gonna credit it to number 14. That's Justin Pappen. And they just make a lot of things happen behind the net. Another time, no look backhander and that was a beautiful one-time goal. Nothing that the net minder and Iyerts could do. And well, Two I, think, nothing. I think the coach would be like, there should have been a defender on him. He should not have been alone by himself in front of the net like that. Yeah, I mean, we saw that a lot in the 14U game. It seemed like everything was even tougher for the goalies. Every, everybody was wide open in front of the net. Meanwhile, played by Holmes. And if blue team isn't careful, partner, this could be a blowout for red. Well, it's early. It's 2 nothing. Huge hit. Well, that's one way to get your teammates back into the game and excited. And a huge hit like that. Pass the center line, Pope with it on his backhand, trying to feed it out in front. No one home, though, so he'll have to play it himself. And as that's covered up, well, he almost had it, but then... Uh, but I like what he did, right? He's going behind the nets. Never a bad idea to center it when there's somebody there. Deflections happen, a shot. That yeah. one's cleared nicely, and here they go the other direction. Shot, rebound, try, and then right into the bread basket. Boy, this red team is making it tough. Other guys that had excellent years, how about Lucas Bailey? He was fabulous this year, 40 goals, 22 assists. Charles Young was third this year in terms of points. He had an even, he had 30 goals, 26 assists, 56 points. So there was a lot of tough decisions for the coaches to make in terms of these All Stars. Some of the names that I've been note, that I've been noting, they're not going to be playing today. It, it was tough. It wasn't just about scoring goals and getting assists. It was about the intangibles of the game, and that's what it took to select these All Stars today. Face off one by Blue as it's over to Masillo. Off the hash mark and back over to the blue line. Now at neutral ice near the Geneva Family Dental sign and then flung into the zone. It's going to be played by Dawes and back over to Dawes. And that was played by the Ollies, the sign we were teasing about earlier today. It's good advertisement along the boards. And 
during that broadcast when the puck is in front of their boards. So at 14U, you play Bantam. 15, you play Midget. And some of the best teams in that previous game, you know, the All-Stars from all the teams, the Blues had a fabulous year. They were 26-2-2. They do have ties at that level. Well, that's the thing. These do not look like Midget players. U15. Stolen away. And this might be either a penalty shot or a penalty. Interesting. I thought he did a good job lifting the stick from behind to allowing the shot, and then the ref blows the whistle. So it'll be our first penalty of the game. I mean, to me, well. So it was I'm, stolen at the last second. It's definitely not a penalty shot because he didn't have a clean avenue to the net. I'm just going to walk away from this one and say I did not see why the referee called the penalty and leave it at that. And we have a faceoff so on, yeah. on to our right. In the box is blue for two minutes. It'll be a red power play. And so they could uh, get a goal here and almost 3-0 lead early in the first period. Overskated the puck, but still got it into the forward zone. Out at the end line. And then that's going to be taken down to the other end. No icing. And, I, and I'm surprised. We called icing. I guess they change it at 15U. We play normal NHL rules. So the last game, you did get called for icing. Right. This game, you did obviously not. Over to the point. Oh, lost possession in the zone there. So minute 13 left on the penalty. Almost stolen for a shorthanded goal attempt. Got to be careful about being too aggressive. Another steal, though. Now two on one, three on one. Yes. In front shot. Oh, what a beautiful save. Oh, my goodness. What a save that time by Nico Sanello. As that caroms almost to a blue player in Trent Stark. Boy, you got to be really careful here. The blue team is putting all the pressure on, and they're shorthanded. Another steal. Unfortunately, nobody to pass it to. Over to Jarzebek is Jarzebek. No look backhander. And he just didn't want to lose the puck that time. He didn't have teammates to go to, and he was going to get a line change once he just cleared it. Boy, when that penalty kill unit gets their fifth player, that could be danger, danger, Will Robinson. So that's a saucer pass off the skate of Phillips, now at the end line, and played by Mirzwa. At the blue line. And great job cycling to his trailer out in front and playing with that puck a little bit too close to his goalie. They're almost stolen by red. It'll be cleared by blue, and that'll do it for the penalty kill. And so Sanello nursing that two-goal lead, plays it himself over to Phillips. I, I think nursing isn't the right word, enjoying that two-goal lead. Shot. Well, Blues had some opportunities, including when they almost scored, but then the penalty was called against red. Well, that's the thing. There's a whole squad of All-Stars on both sides. So if it doesn't go well for one line, maybe it'll go well for the next line. Two-goal lead, you know, that can evaporate pretty quick. With the puck is Pappen. And I'm wondering if he's uh, Jim Pappen's son. Remember Jim Pappen? I think Pappen had two Ps in the last name, if I recall. So it wouldn't, my, be, wouldn't be a relation. One of my dad's uh, favorite mar players. He's Jim Pappen. Him and Pitt Martin. Obviously, oh, man, yep. Obviously, Makita and Hole too. Oh, my goodness, McQuillan! McGallan just absolutely demolished the intended check man in Luca <laughs> Ortega. It's kind of, you, you know, the best analogy to make, like a running back that just destroys the linebacker is trying to tackle him. Yeah, I think it looked more like just an accidental collision than a check, and unfortunately he wasn't ready for the, the contact. Yeah, I mean, like, he, like uh, McGallan was supposed to be checked hard under the ice, and he said, I don't think so. <laughs> and tapped off the boards. It's all red right now. Well, and that should have been offsides. Yeah, but Blue is showing flashes of brilliance on that penalty kill. So when that line comes around again, it's not going to be a, you know, such, such a blowout. Right on stride with the pass. That shot a little bit high. And then back over to the end line. As after it is Conroe. So we've seen Red score a couple of goals. One was a garbage goal. The second one was a beautiful pass and then a finish. And uh, it's going to be tough for Caden I. Eilerts, he gives up one more goal, that could be the game. Well, and unfortunately, it was 2-0 that, that they were beh uh, behind. And then facing 
a power play. So that could have easily been a third goal and almost put it out of reach early in the first period. But even a three-goal lead in the first period in an All-Star game, I wouldn't think would be out of reach. Face-off one by Red. It's on the stick of Dawes. No look backhander over to Germain. And then McQuillan will play it near the Coors light sign. Got to get all those advertisers in, huh? On the hash mark, wide open man, Conroe shooting, maybe getting a glove on that was Eilert's. Any way you slice it, another opportunity for Red, and Blue has to go coast to coast with it. But perfect patience, though, spinning around behind the puck to get behind the puck so he can put some force behind it. Unfortunately, it just went wide. Tap pass, nice creativity there, partner. Unselfish play, taps it over and forward to a teammate, lost oh, an edge, though. And then he lost it. That's why you should always sharpen your skates once every three games. That's what happens when you don't get them sharpened. Out in front, Cook had it. In the slot, shot. Went wide. Got to get that shot on that, partner. We saw that earlier, too. A lot of wide shots from the 14s. You need to get them on net. Here's a steal at the blue line. And giveaway again. McQuillan. He's played a lot of minutes today. And this is cool. You've got, like, the, you've got the little phone shot. That's along with the replay. And Germain off his stick. Germain. Stop and start move. Backhander, ill-advised, easy steal for Blue. Stark, and he fell to the ice. That's a trip. Oh, they're going to call that one, too. And that's fine, Partner. You just got to be consistent with it. Anything close to that, you got to call a trip the rest of the game. Yeah, I wouldn't let that go myself. But the technical right. direction here is terrific. They had a little picture in picture in the center there. You had the replay going on one of the pictures. So the this, live action. This penalty is brought to you by Beef Shack, home of the cheesy beef. So we've got... Two camera angles up top here and then a wireless camera somewhere walking around. What I want to know is if I order an Italian beef at Portillo's and I, and I want cheese on it, is that a replica of the cheesy beef? It's not the original cheesy beef? Yeah, I wouldn't think that uh, Portillo's would use the same. So it's a blue power play. Red's in the box for 152. It's over. So I like this. Blue's taking shots. That one was wide, but they're getting the rebounds with the extra person they can do that. That's an interesting move. There, they put that move on the replay on the big board. Nicely done. Terrific technical direction being done here by the steel personnel. And we have some shout outs that we need to say to you as a bunch of sponsors, as well as some families contributing towards paying for this All Star game. It's the first time in SBS history we're corroborating and collaborating with the Chicago Steel. Well, it's very much so. Uh, the steel people are doing the camera work, the technical direction in the back. We're in front with the play by play. Out to neutralize, tapped off the boards. Yes, here's a chance for Blue, and just past the stick. Glenview Stars Hockey Association sends a shout out to Luke Radel from our Bantam Majors. Congrats on making the CSDHL All-Star team. We're so proud of you, and thank you for being a quote-unquote star. Congratulations and good luck today to Orland Park Viking U16, Joey Bledsoe, as that backhander just goes past the glove of the netminder and Nico Sanello. I don't think you need the quotes around the star. I think they truly are stars. If you make the all-star team, you're not a quote star. You are a star. Or maybe he's not a star and he just bribed the coach with a $50 bill to get into the game. <laughs> $25 per quote, right? <laughs> Cozy cycles the puck to the corner. You ever see the movie The Bench Warmers? I don't remember seeing that one. It's I not that good, but there's that funny scene where... They use a guy with a mustache and they give the, the umpire a $20 bill. He's got, <laughs> he's, got, he's, got, he's got a birth certificate off the stick and no rebound try. Out behind the net, oh, red plate. There goes the net. Yeah, I, I like the play on. I mean, Blue clearly had the advantage. No need to give Red a free uh, line change. I like that. And then the goalie made some net maintenance uh, while the puck is going the other direction. And it's all good. That shot. And covered up. Oh, he had it. This could be interesting. 
Trying to stick handle the way around the D is Catalano. Catalano to himself. Catalano still has it. Catalano with the slot. Backhanded out. That'll do it for the period, but it's all red thus far. They lead in shots on goal, 7-5. And in terms of goals, 2-0. Final thoughts, partner, before we take a break. Caden Jackson with the garbage goal and then the beautiful goal to make it 2-0. Yeah, after the first period, I don't know if I'm the blue team. I'm going to make too many adjustments. I think the, the coach is going to say maybe you do this a little different, that a little different, but not a whole, not a wholesale kind of a change. They are down two. They're only down in two shots in terms of shots on goal. So no major changes expected here. Now, eight and a half minutes from now, they're going to have a, um, a Zamboni come out. So you only got to play eight minutes before the coach really has an opportunity to address the whole team. But maybe they'll see if they have to make a change then. But truth be known, they haven't scored yet. All right, we'll take a quick 30-second break. You're watching Red Against Blue here on SBS. So we're going to mute. Eight minutes and 30 seconds, and then we get a Zamboni. I'm Kyle Smith alongside Bob Vilsaway. We'll see what adjustments, if any, that the blue team is making. And, of course, this blue team is led by head coach Bob Jakubek and assisted by Brennan Devers and Taylor Hoy. Face off, and we'll say that one's won by blue as kicking it to a teammate that time. Uh, was Ian Manisco, and then over to Neutral Ice. Played right now by Masillo. Masillo with a Masillo. He still has it as Masillo trying to find a teammate, the trailer. He's trying to feed it to Ortega. And then back out behind the net. And we talked about it earlier. The, uh, the communication between lines and players isn't quite like it would be on a normal team because they're just put together for this game. Justin Pappen, Pappen. Out front, no one home to retrieve it. Blind pass to no one. Now a two on two. That shot, pad saved. No one home for the rebound. Pappen looking to clear. So far in this game, Pappen's been all over the ice. And McGollin with it now. Backhanded pass, losing a stick. Hopefully it's not broken. They are very expensive to replace. <laughs> yeah, they're not twigs anymore. Pass the blue line. I mean, everybody uses fiberglass, no more wooden sticks. And as awesome as the movie The Natural is, where, it, where the lightning hits the tree and then he makes the baseball <laughs> bat out of the tree, I don't think they do that with baseball bats anymore. I mean, you still make it wood, obviously, but do you really cut the tree in your backyard then make the bat? Out behind the net, trying to feed it out in front, and no one home to retrieve it. It was deflected by Red, and back in it off the boards. Feinstein shot. And blue team continuing the four-check pressure. Icing it is red. I think that was off the stick of Feinstein. The linesman agrees. We play on. And now picked up by Stark as he feeds it to the hash mark. Puck obtained by Red. Now back over to Blue. Red, Conroe. Off the stick of Cook. Oh, that pass had that connected. Turns out instead uh, icing. Good idea, though. He, he, yeah. he saw his cherry-picking player call for the puck. Did a little spin move and just passes tape. Well, and I like what he did, too. He led him a little bit. I, I feel like if there was going to be a breakaway, the player had to move forward to be able to collect that pass. I think the player was staying there. I forgot who it was, right? But the player was staying there waiting for the, the, the pass to come to him instead of ahead of him. Out front. Rogers. Stolen by Red. Now puck accepted by Reuthberg. Reuthberg, nice pass. Reuthberg oh, calls for it. Another pass. Had it connected, would have been in the net. We got some nice German and Scandinavian last names, don't we? We got. <laughs> My favorite name is uh, Viersba. I don't know how to pronounce it. I just like it. <laughs> I think it's Viersba. But you got you got you got, got Wolkoff and 
Reitberg. I feel like we're in Vienna and Berlin right now. Yeah, not Mayerswa, but Vierswa. Number 12. Yeah. Kelby. Over to DeSosa. I've never met a Kelby before. No look pass and spinorama when he passed it. <laughs> I mean, they haven't practiced that much together, partner, but, we, but you wouldn't know it as you watch today's game. DeSosa's pass to his teammate off the point. Shot, loose puck. It's in the net. Oh, I no, thought it was. No, they're waving it off. They're waving it off. Not sure why. Whew, we're going to watch it on replay in a second. I thought it would pass the end line. Yeah, I have to admit, I agree. I thought it was a goal, but the referee waved it off for some reason. Maybe that was under the control of the goalie and it was slotted out. We're going to see the, we are going to see the replay right here at center ice. It, you can make the argument it's right on the line, not past the line. So maybe it never made it in. That's why no goal. I mean, that's a huge call, partner, because 3 nothing would probably do in blue. But what I really like is the referee was right there in the position to make the call, made the call right away. No, no doubt. No, is, anybody, nobody's got any doubt about the call being correct. This will be offsides. <laughs> and defenseman Hunter Pope is asking, what did we do? Well, when your teammate goes past the blue line... <laughs> Before you go past the blue line, that's called offsides, a.k.a. cheating. <laughs> this isn't street puck. We have rules. The Constitution of Hockey says that's offside. There's no offsides on outdoor ponds. <laughs> so what's your favorite hockey movie, Bob? Favorite hockey movie? Stolen away by Red. I mean, off the, the side of the net. The doc, yeah, the documentary, of course, about the the, um, the Olympic team, Miracle on Ice. That Miracle. Would be my, yeah, that'd okay. be my favorite one. But I, I like movies that are based on real things, not fiction, not science fiction that couldn't possibly happen. I'm okay with science fiction, but so, so does it annoy you that the most movie, the most Academy Awards that a movie has won is a science fiction movie? Star Wars. Well, sorry, fantasy movie. No, uh, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. Oh, it, it, well, it, I wouldn't say it annoys me, but those are movies I do not follow. Off the boards, feeding it in front. Here's a chance for Red. Shot! Oh! Nicely, nicely defended. Might have barely hit the post. It definitely went off the side of the net. It was a shot attempt by Viersba. And yeah, you got a Kelby Viersba and a Tony Mirzwa. Yeah, but Masolo did a good job interrupting that play, so to speak. Out behind the net. Played by Walcott. Yeah, Porter was wide open. If that cent if centering pass could have gotten to him, the goalie was on the other side, probably the wrong side of the net. And this got to go to retreat. Walcott. Oh, here we go. Breakaway coming up. Viersba shot. Save a beauty off the stick. He needed to elevate it. Goalie did a great job sticking the right leg out. Red is just inching closer to putting this one away, and they've been so close several times. Blue. Yeah, blue needs a couple more thrusts like they did on that penalty kill. Oh, Out white. front backhander. Oh. And Some great passing right in front, but unfortunately put the puck right in the goalie's bread basket. Easy save. Yeah, Vincent Cozy on the backhander. Make sure to check out the Youth Hockey Experience, home of the steel here at Fox Valley Ice Arena. Sending a shout out to Coach Tim Mueller from the Northwest Chargers. Congrats on your 52 year career coaching youth hockey. Sending a shout out to Braden McQuillan of the Cyclones U15s. Congratulations on a good, great year. As another shout out to Ethan Lopez and all the CSDHL All-Stars from the Orland Park Vikings. Congrats on making the All-Star team from the Lopez family. Setting a shout out to Mitchell Gaywell of the Vikings U16s. Congrats on a great season and for making the All Star team. From May Cara, from Ray Cara and Caden at Precision Dent Removal. This shout out goes to Chase Magalan from the Vikings U15 team. Congrats on making the All Star team. Love mom, dad, Hunter, Maya, and grandma. We're all proud of you on and off the ice. I like these shout outs. That's a good one. And congrats to all the Orland Park Vikings for making their all-star team. And a very special shout out to our Joey Bledsoe of the U16s. Grandma and Grandpa are so proud of you. Go get them. We, are, we love you. Out front and good play that time oh. by, by uh, O'Shea. 
Yeah, collision between the blue players, otherwise they might have had another attempt. Now blue is finally starting to put the, the pressure on. We're even in terms of shots on goal. 10 for red and eight for blue. O'Shea, they'll reset and regroup in their own zone. Goes back over to the other side. Up in the air, here we go, one-on-one. -on -one. Magalin, Magalin, and he's hit hard <laughs> that time. Revenge. That time, D'Souza clearly levels Magalin after Magalin leveled Ortega. So finally, Magalin gets a, a body and falling to the ice. And then sent into the zone. Manisco tired, and he'll take a seat on the bench. Well, we didn't expect a... a a, uh, empty goals by Blue today. A yeah. shutout was not really expected. No, and then you know, one, oh, here we go. We might end yeah. quickly here. Two on two. Shot. Nice, nice save, save that time by Sinello. So from minute 38 to go to the halfway point, Blue almost scored. But like you said, shots are almost even, 10 to nine. So two, shot, two goals and 10 shots are red. No goals and nine shots are Blue. Active glove, when you have one, makes you very valuable on the ice as a, as a net miner. Out to neutral ice, dangerous pass. German stole it. German, Conroe couldn't touch it, otherwise it would have been offside. Made a good heads up call not to touch it. And uh, they have called off a lot of icings today, partner, and some of them I've disagreed with, that one including. Well, just because you can touch it doesn't mean you need to touch it. Right. And then it becomes a judgment call. Yeah. The problem is if you don't touch it because you thought it was going to be icing and the ref says play on, then you got to go coast to coast with it from your own end. <laughs> Another good check from behind there. Yeah, if it was from behind, this it would is, be a penalty. This is a two-on-one that's developing. Make it a three-on-one. Wide open in front. Oh, my goodness. What a play by Jackson Burgess. Play the game thus far. Yeah, diving <laughs> truly last resort to get that puck and did it. A pinch and a shot. Cook with the first uh, last shot attempt and then over to the faceoff circle. And these just look like better than your 15s teams, obviously, an all-star game. Two, Red has time. Mm, two on one was developing there, but broke down. Breakaway coming up for Red. A deke, a shot, a save. And a lot of harassment by the defender on that to prevent that from being a goal. And it was good defense, too. If he had hacked at the legs, it would have been a penalty shot. And that will do it for the period. Red team in control thus far. Final thoughts before we go to the Zamboni break. Well, 2-0, and unless Blue changes something, we're looking at a 4-0 final. I think the projection early on made by Ryan Cook was that the Blue team was going to win 4-2. So he's predicting four straight goals. All right, we're going to take a break. You are watching SBS, the broadcasting network for everyone. To the city that invented the skyscraper, reversed the flow of a river, created its own style of pizza, gave a home to legends and
Broadcast Solutions, a broadcasting network for everyone. Good, looking sharp in both crews. This is really an excellent race. St. Ignatius at that 34, 35. You can hear the fans here. Loyola looking excellent as well. Here comes the Loyola Ramblers. Good. Good, and we've got some open water there, some open water between St. Ignatius and Loyola. We've got, you know, maybe about a boat length open. To the city that invented the skyscraper, reversed the flow of a river, created its from the icon Properties, Christie's International Real Estate.
We got to have... in the box red, right? Back to the action, guys. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties with the audio, but we're back with six minutes to go. I thought we just wanted to, to find out what it sounded like when we weren't talking. All right, we're back, I guess. Hold on. So irritating. Back to the action, guys. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties with the audio, but we're back with six minutes to go. Still on the power play is blue. That shot off the top. That's because it's not a headphone jack, man. Uh, you got, did, something got unplugged. Here, give me the thing. Back to the action, guys. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties with the audio. We're going to, I don't know. Five oh seven to go. Five oh five now. Each team with eleven shots on goal. Catalano with a nice pass out in front, past the blue line. Chance, and he's tripped. And that's gonna be a. Oh man, he might be hurt too. Yeah, oh boy. Yeah, he hit the boards face first, essentially, right after that trip. Wasn't oh pretty. Oh boy, Jackson Burgess. You hope it's not his knee. Oh boy. He was definitely tripped. Did he have a clean avenue at the net? Well, it would be a power. It would be a penalty shot if he had a clean avenue towards the net. Well, no, I don't think we're going to get a penalty shot out of it. But the referee it was a trip from behind. The referee is calling it. Called it right away. That's the only downside about an all-star game. It's kind of an exhibition game in a lot of ways. You, you hate to get injured in it for the regular season kind of a thing. But the checking hasn't been especially heavy. Here we're going to see a replay in the center camera. At least yes. we get the benefit of this replay. So Burgess splits through the D beautifully. It almost looked like it wasn't a trip. He got slashed in the chest and pulled a LeBron. But, you know, he got obviously yanked down. So in the box is blue for two minutes. They had to hurt, though. Hit the boards full speed. Down ice, no icing. Four thirty to go in the period. Red on the attack. They were offside. <laughs> Make sure to check out the Chicago Steel's ticket plan madness. Five free games, playoffs, one Rockford Ice Hogs game for the season. Face off one by Blue, backhanded. Oh, it was a chance for German. 
His shot way too high off the glass and then Karam's back to the point. That shot past the end line. Now played by Ortega. He was drilled by uh, Chase Magalin earlier in the game. Taking off the puck well is Stark as Phillips played the body. Yeah, the level, level of checking is going higher as the ages go up. Now after it is Manisco. They shot a little bit wide. The goalie grabbed it and put it back down. No face off. Over to the corner. And Phillips, did he get him on the side? They're going to say play on. It looked like it was directly from behind on the check. Well, but it was a light check. Shot Got into it. that. Blue team finally scores. That was a perfectly placed shot to the goalie's right. Hit the net just behind the post. Goalie can't guard the whole net, so two to one. Only one goal game now with a whole half of a game to play still for the most part. Short-handed goal. Remember earlier, Blue had a, just a, a frenzy when they were short-handed earlier, but didn't score, and here they got this short-handed goal. Over to Blue. Bounces off the uh -oh. boards, losing an edge. Back in and over to Neutral Ice. It was off the stick of Pope. And then over to Porter. Porter past the blue line. His shot right into the glove of the netminder for Blue as we stop play with 3.18 to go. It was a good stop. Face off to the goalie's left. So Blue still has to re realize, even though they scored that goal, they're still killing the penalty here. So for 26 more seconds, they've got to kill this penalty. Then they can try to tie the score up or get another penalty and get another shorty. Face off one by Red. Over to the hash mark. Out in front, chance for Red. And they might have been a little bit too cute with it as Austin Maddich had a clean shot and said he tried to offload it to Porter. Oh man, but Porter. <laughs> Puck just stayed at his feet there and it didn't get the trigger pulled. Yeah, it but looked I like it went off a blue skate too. Could be that. Yeah, it was just, a, I think that passing was terrific. It just didn't finish. Sometimes you can get too key with it though. When you're that close at point blank range, just shoot, man. Yeah, but I didn't think he had a clean shot at that just shoot man spot. Look at this, three on one again. Sure looked like he did. As he was trying to feed at that time to Rogers and covered like up that. by the net monitor. Yeah, kick, he hit it right at the goalie and maybe hope for a weird deflection, a bad handle. Rebound, something. Today's game, of course, brought to you by Plato's Closet Batavia. Check them out on Instagram at Plato's Closet Batavia. This time they brought that up when it wasn't a penalty. Face off, one by blue, but red gets it quickly. As after it is Viersba. My favorite name. Oh, you're yeah. the other one. There's a Viersba yeah. and an Antoni Mierzwa. They're right. both on the same team. <laughs> there it that is. shot, he Rebound. scores! That one might be on the netminder for not covering it up quick enough. Yeah, it's just not good rebound control. That's why he put a big person right in front of the goalie for exactly that purpose. Purpose. If he can't grab the rebound, in this case, he shot it right around the goalie who was on the ground. Now, if the goalie had the pad spread wider apart, that wouldn't have been a goal, but here's the replay. Easy rebound in the net. Tapped in that time by Ian Manisco. And just like that, no more two goal lead. It's back to 2-2 slash 0-0 hockey. Now what we don't know is during the, the intermission what adjustments, if any, were made by the blue team. So one would have to say since they scored the last two goals, they probably did make some adjustments and that is working. And they are now also ahead on the shots on goal. And here's another that shot one. gloved well by the netminder for Red. Right, kind of shot it at the goalie, but now they're up to 15 shots on goal. So they have a 15 to 12 shots on goal lead and the score is tied. So blue has figured out what ails them and has come out strong here in this last half of the second period. Face off one by Blue, winning it is Vincent Cozy. And now what does Red have to do to readjust? It looked like they were gonna put this one away. They had so many opportunities. The puck almost crossed the end line twice on the same play. And that didn't make it three nothing, and now it's two to two. Well, and this is it. For, for Red, it's scary a little bit because the adjustments that were made by blue worked. That shot right into the glove. 
And now they don't have another period. Well, I guess between the second and the third period, but you only get a couple of minutes, like a long time out to make any adjustments you know, the red might need to make. Now the blue has made some adjustments. That's the thing about games like this. It starts out one way or other, and you make an adjustment, and then you get an advantage, and the other team readjusts to that, and it goes back and forth. Right now, blue's just adjustments are working. Face-off, blue wins it. That was a tie-up action right on the face-off between Walkopf and Reutberg. Meanwhile, past the center line, good job of Blue to stay on side. Walkopf shot blocked at a beauty. Uh, that time by Adams. Adams played terrific defense holding down that angle. So, Michalik and Manisco with the goals for Blue. And for Red, Pappen and Jackson. We got another penalty here. You know, we talk a lot about face-offs, and it's pretty clean. There's really not one person that has done excellently, if that's even a verb, <laughs> or terrifically, very good. So Graham to the box. But uh, in terms so Blue of... Does, sorry, Blue does well on the penalty kills, so maybe they can get another shorthanded goal and take the lead. But for red guys to uh, look out for that could win faceoffs, Jackson today is four of seven, and Magdalene is three of five. Adams did a great job keeping that puck in, but then lost it. And for blue, how about this partner? Michalik has taken 14 faceoffs. He's won eight and lost six. That's a lot of faceoffs. Red team scores! Phillips, and just like that, red team back on top. That penalty cost them. Graham going to the, the bench. His head looks up, not down, so keep your head up. Now Blue's got to come back again one more time. And I mean, when he's wide open like that, partner, there's really not much the netminder can do. Well, and he put it right in the spot where the goalie just wasn't there. 39 seconds ago. So Pass now it's the blue line. So now red doesn't have to change anything. Now chance for blue out in front. Shot, glove save, and a beauty up. Couldn't finish freezing it, so we play on. Again, and rebound control. Well, it's somewhat of a break for red because now they're on the four check. If they had covered it up, it would have been a free line change for Blue. 12 seconds left, last chance for Red. Adams shot, and it went off Manisco. And Red still has the lead, as that will do it for the period. So after all that, Blue comes down, down two goals, but Red then sneaks back with a goal by Phillips. We'll take a break. Third period coming up next here on SBS. Plato's Closet has athletic wear from all the top brands. Um, joggers, anyone? Our prices will get you moving, and we'll pay cash for your stuff. Buy and sell right here at Plato's Closet. Three two the score as red was up two nothing and now it's three to two. Well, they it, you know at the end of the day, at the end of that second half of the second period, they cut the lead in half. So now it's a one goal that they are chasing now instead of two goals that they're chasing. But only one more period, 17 minutes to go to chase that final goal. 
Bouncing off the boards. And of course, all these adjustments I'm talking about, it's quite possible that the coaches are just saying, continue to play hard and do your best, show off, and no adjustments have been made. And sometimes the puck goes in, sometimes it doesn't. There's no lack of hustle from anybody. As it's played right now by Dawes. Past the center line, now past the blue line. Out behind the netminder. Trying to feed it over to the boards. Mirzwa had it. Mirzwa, wide open man in front. Shot, oh, oh my, my goodness. goodness. But a, oh, off the post. Into no the glove. Goal. Oh my goodness. One of the best hockey saves I think I've seen at any level. It wide open in front. Completely deked yeah. out on the ground. And I think the puck probably hit the back end of the goalie stick yeah. to not go in. We got to see the replays. How about that? A 2 on 0 What a stick save. Front of and the then goal. just oh, he, he got post, post locked. <laughs> he overthought it. He didn't think he had as much time as he actually did. If he had just taken another split second, it would have been a goal. Well, he couldn't really take any more time because the defense was there. So he had to shoot it when he did, hit the post. There was a goalie stick. Backhander involved. tried to go top. It bounced over the goalie stick back again out front, just like the earlier goal. Uh oh, here we go. Bounced over the point. Pass the blue line. Look at that toe drag shot. Loose puck. He scores! Oh my goodness. That's basically a two goal swing. Red got post blocked and then blue with the rebound goal. And they're going to credit it to Ethan Feinstein. Feinstein, I like this. 3 3. Third period. 15 minutes to go. The initial save was made, the second shot over the goalie's pads. The goalie just we, couldn't stop the we top need to, shelf We need to shot. start calling blue team the Cardiac Cats. They have nine lives. <laughs> it was 2 nothing, then 3-2, to two, then it should have been 4-2. to two. A fabulous save by Dane Simpson. And, and the then, post. Yeah, and the, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen that. A wraparound try where all he had to do was get it past the post, but it went right off the post on the wraparound try. And, and then offside. Feinstein offside. Feinstein from the Afton Americans. I mean, red team, I mean, they've got to be just snake bitten right now. It looked like they were going to score. They have two on O, by the way. Couldn't score. First shot saved by Dane Simpson. Next shot off the post, and then Feinstein the rebound. I mean, it seems like a momentum switcher. Well, absolutely a momentum switcher. 4-2 is way different than 3-3. Three, three. But that goalie save, he stuck his stick out just exactly at the right height, the right distance to block the shot, which caused then the wraparound to happen. And of course, the, the puck hit the post instead of going over and sticking in. I mean, the goalie was prone, no way to stop anything and just hit the post. Good they, hustle, you know, Dylan, uh, Caleb Shrout came back to, to hurry that shot, bu shot up and that's probably what caused the puck to hit the post. But th what, what a barn burner we got going here. 3-3 three, three with 15 minutes to go in the third period. Face off, one by Red. They flip it off the boards. Did he touch that with the stick? If so, it's high sticking, but we play on. Now back past the center line. Yeah, I don't know why players do that. They know it's going to be an instant whistle if the puck hits that stick. Well, you could touch it with your stick, and then you got to move away from the puck and let the defense get it. So you can still play on when you high stick. I mean, players try to get away with a ricochet and try to go off the side of the net. Butterfly style by the net miner and Dane Simpson. You know, partner, we talked about the difference between 1.88 and 2.34. Well, Dane Simpson's in the net right now. What does that <laughs> tell you? Saucer pass right on target. Just couldn't finish the play by Trent Stark. Out in front, another drive for Blue. That shot. And then All right, so, and Yeah, we've had Martin. shots on both goalies, and both have been major deflections. So the goalies are doing a great job staying with the shot and handling the deflections. So here's a wholesale change from both teams. It's kind of like a whole different set of warriors on the ice for both teams here. Over to the neutral zone. German was after it. Chance now, shot off the pad. Phillips, his shot blocked.
Over to the blue line. Shot. It was blocked again by Blue. Now to the corner. Oh, the penalty and again, a tripping. It's going to be a tripping call. Red, and now touched by Blue, and we'll stop play at 13.58. So we've had several penalties in this game. Those penalties definitely changed the outcome. So is a trip. So going into the proverbial sin bin, Walcott. Face off one by Red as it's back over to the blue line. And covered up well by the netminder in uh, Logan Marsh, sorry, no, uh, Dane Simpson. And good thing it was covered up. And the Arizwa was lurking right out in front. If that puck landed in front, he could have gotten a stick on it, would have gone right around the goalie pads again. So good defensive play. Over to the blue line, Phillips with it to the faceoff circle, now to the end line. Tap behind the net. And couldn't cover it up that time by Simpson, out behind the net. Did a good job to get the puck behind the net, get control, and slowly send it down the other way for a foot race. Past the center line, Mirzwa. I was thinking when that puck crossed the offsides line there, and it looks to me like it's going to be offsides. A little bit of a delayed whistle, but definitely called. So 3-3 with 13.25 to go. In a very, very close and exciting game. And we, we said earlier that it was going to be hard to keep up with that first game in terms of excitement. Well, <laughs> here we are, 3-3 in the third. Into the zone, wrapped around the boards. After it right now is Masillo. As that's backhanded out to neutral ice. Now pass the blue line, German with it. To the corner. At the end line, Red has it out in front. Trying to get it with Dawes and now out behind the net to the corner. To the face-off circle, getting a piece of it. Dawes after it. Dawes taps it, gets it himself. To the slot, now to the end line. Near the crease. Yeah, Dawes had to make a couple major judgment calls right in a row on defense. If you make that judgment call wrong, you end up with an odd man break the other way. Maintain possession. That's why the puck is still in the zone even now. Turn around. Off the net, Another that should be a trip. Yep. We're going to have a uh, five on three for about 10 seconds. As wisely going to the bench is the netminder and Logan Marsh. And here we go. So for 11 seconds, we'll have five on three hockey. So they got to survive that initial rush of 11 seconds, somehow get the puck out of the zone, keep it in the corner or something, right? And then they got to kill off two more minutes in a 3-3 game with only 12 to go in the third. So this, this next 11 seconds are crucial, and then next two minutes are, are the next <laughs> level of crucial. Face-off one by Red. Over to D'Souza, to the face-off circle. Oh, and weeding nice that well is blue, so yep. that'll do it for the five on three. Now here comes the five on four. And make it a two on two, Walkop as he was trying to find Manisco. A 3-3 tie partner, we could have another overtime game. It's headed that way, isn't it? But right now we got a power, power play going on, so 4-3 is just as likely as 3-3 at the end of this. Not much on that pass, and wisely covering it up quickly as Simpson. So it's been pretty even hockey partner, 18-17 in terms of shots on goal, red led 2-0, blue with two unanswered goals. Red made a three to two, should have scored arguably. <laughs> the amazing save off the, off the stick and then got post blocked and then the absolute fabulous goal by Feinstein to tie it up. Well, Red has had control of this game. Like you said, they were ahead two zero and then they tied it up, right? Got tied up and then went ahead three two. So Red's always been in control of the game. But at the end of the day, it's still tied and anything can happen. That shot blocked and then off the netting. 
So if you're a betting person, you'd have to bet on the next goal going towards red since they've had the lead 100% of this game, except when it's been tied, of course. Shot. Face off one by blue and then over out behind the net. Shots on goal leader for Red is Charles Jackson with four. How about that, partner? He scored the first goal of the game. His first shot was that garbage goal. Yep, and then uh, my favorite name, Vier's, Kelby Viersba, three shots on goals next. So we have Chase Maglin has been fabulous on the faceoffs. He's six of eight, six of eight, and Charles Jackson, six of nine. That's a big part of the game, partner. When you win face-offs, it changes complexions of the game. Yeah, I think it's one of those underrated things. You know, people think it's a face-off, what's it matter? You know, goals don't happen. But having their first possession after a face-off is a major advantage. So Michalik, he's just played all game, it seems like. He has 16 face-offs, eight wins, eight losses. Well, when you have a good face-off artist, you use him. But he's 50% today. Well, maybe he's, uh, well, he is an all-star. And he's <laughs> facing off against another all-star. Well played. Ethan Feinstein is you know, five out of six on the face-offs. That's pretty darn good. Close to perfect. And of course, that's our judgment on who actually maintains possession after the face-off. Yeah, I mean, it just has to be a clean win. It doesn't matter what happens after you pass it to your defenseman. And or sometimes if you push the puck forward, so some teams will be down a goal late in the game. And so the center will try to shoot it towards the net. So that's actually a face-off win, even though the puck went the opposite direction. So he's looking for a breakaway there. Feinstein trying to get open by himself. <laughs> would have been a two, maybe a three-line pass if that connected. And of course, a three-line pass would be offsides. That would be over the blue line. Three, three, 10 minutes to go. You feel like saying, what's in store for us now in this next 10 minutes, plus possible three more minutes? Five minutes more, then a shootout. Everyone is getting their money's worth today. Face off one by Red, shot! And he wasn't exactly ready for that. It almost went into the net. He's gotta be tired though, partner. He's literally stood on his head to maintain this 3-3 tie. Well, they're young. They have adrenaline. I mean, they're living for this. What is, again, back to what a great opportunity to play. And these players are all going to get better because of this game that they're playing in. And that's, at the end of the day, the goal. These players want to have a future in hockey. So in terms of shots today, it's been a, <laughs> a busy day for Ian Manisco. Five shots on goal and one shot that did not get registered as an SOG. For the opposite team in red. Yes, beautiful toe drag, chance falling to the ice, pushed away by Pope. And did he tug at the leg? I don't think so. I think he just fell down. Well, and the referee's arm didn't go up with that little red stripe, so we know nothing happened wrong. Well, <laughs> according to the ref, nothing went wrong. Something might have clearly gone wrong, and they just didn't call it. There's a tough hit. It's getting chippy, partner. That's what happens when you don't call penalties right away. Oh, look at that. Well, I mean, this is hockey. You know, both teams want to win. It's 3 3 in the third. They're all good. I do like the cages they have on their faces, so you can't have a Bedard broken jaw on a check like that. Charles Dax Jackson with four shots on goal. Backhanded shot off the glove. Loose puck. And then smothered up at the crease by Dane Simpson. <laughs> Not standing on his head, laying on his head on that one. Yeah. That was a nice pass. So Logan Marsh has given up two goals, one goal given up for Sanello. Three shots on goal for Landon Porter. Three for Viersba. Face off one by Blue over to Red off the... I think that might actually hit the post. No, nah, it went off his pad. There's Manisco. Sorry, that's Ethan Newberg, and now over out to the crease. Picked up by Red. 
How about that pass partner in between two blue players and was yeah, right on the tape? Yeah, I'm surprised. If it connected, I would have been surprised. Yes. Nice, toe, <laughs> nice yeah. drag there. Yeah, Masillo with it. On the tape with that pass, off the pad. Oh, they were fortunate the, the rebound slot. didn't go the other way. And then backhand and then over to German. German past the blue line. Out in front. <laughs> that was a nice redirect. Beautiful well defended. Yeah. Obviously the goal he was expecting. There was not a whole lot of mustard on that tap. And easy save turns out to be, but dangerous play. It was a good feed over to Jackson Conroe. And that was by design partner. One pass and a redirection, but able to save it as Simpson. Well, it was well executed too. It was, like we talk about NFL open and you know college open. That was NFL open pass. These are 15s. Cook lost it over to Red. It was retrieved by Jackson Burgess. And he's back on the ice partner and you love to see it. He, he took a nasty fall into the boards. Because that was earlier in the game. That Burgess, he's, he must be 100% healthy because that was a big check delivered by number eight. Stark sends it into the zone, off the pad. Chance now for Blue, but tapping it away. That time was Owen D'Souza. Up in the air. After it is Demko. Instead, we'll take it as Stark. And attacking him is Jarzebek. Backhanded pass. And now into the zone of Blue team, Walcott. A little tap pass over to Stark. As Stark is defended by Jackson. Back into the zone. Couple of nice handles past the blue line. On the four check is blue. Backhanded pass in the slot, retrieved by Red. Obtained past the blue line, and then sending into the zone by Viersba. He'll go to the bench for a line chain. Accepting the puck is Viersba. Off the hash mark. Now played by Cook. Four-handed pass. Phillips got in the way of it. Phillips still in the zone. Plays through the check, trying to feed it saucer pass style, but reading it well is Demko, and then out behind the net. Now after it and playing it is Walkoff at the blue line. Cook with it. He's got three defenders around him. Cook with some nice moves. Cook still with it. And how about that, Parter? He got past the D, had the puck behind the net. Well, he had a job to do there, right? The rest of the blue team was changing on that, so he tried to drive the, the puck into the zone as deep as he could, knowing there was nobody he could pass to. That's hence why it was a one-on-three. Now, if that were a basketball game, everybody would say, you can't go one-on-three and try and score, but... He had no teammates. They're all changing on the, the line change. Catalano to the blue line. As Magalin was after it, now Pappen. Catalano attacks, but bouncing it off the boards over to Shrout. Manisco, and good job playing the body that time by Dawes. He's a late addition. The original player was going to be John Sitar, but he's injured today. Happened with it. Yeah, and Dawes is playing great today. Too. Happened shot save again by Dane Simpson. You had said it earlier. You, you were looking at the stats down there, and you were picking out some players who had a lot of goals. And for example, we're not here on this All Star game, right? That's what Dawes feels like. You know, he was the next one up right, when somebody couldn't make it. But he's a very good player. He's earning he he's earning his stripes on this All Star. So just five minutes, 37 seconds, going to 3-3 tie. Shots on goal are still pretty close, 22-19. So this is just a close game between two good teams or, you know, 40 really good players. 19-22, and those are the steal stats for shots on goal. And Reutberg continues to impress on the faceoff. He's 7 of 11. Jackson, 6 of 10. And it's been a busy day for Austin Maidich. He is 6 of 12 on the faceoffs. What a day for Michalik. He, he took 17 faceoffs going into the late action of the third period. It's tiring, man. You got to get low on the stick. Rebound, try for red. Loose puck in the slot. Up in the air, kick it in the net. <laughs> it was last touched by Christian Reutberg. I think when the puck goes to the point, though, you got to do a little bit more, keep your body behind it so it doesn't bounce over your stick. So if it does bounce over your stick, hits your legs and stays in the zone. We see the puck getting past the point several times. It's been leading to some odd man breaks. At the neutral zone. And now it's decision time for both coaching staffs. When do you decide to pinch and when do you decide to just play for overtime? 
Yeah, I'm going to say that both coaches are making no decision on that. In other words, just saying the way that we've been playing, keep playing, don't change. If they end that up in shot. Over <laughs> almost. Yep. If they end up in overtime, you know, from my perspective, it's pretty exciting. They get to play another five minutes of three on three. And then shootouts, even more fun. We might get two of those today. And uh, he might be hurt as we keep an eye on Antoni Mirzwa. He was slow to get to the bench. Yeah, he better not be hurt. He's a good player. Oh, dangerous play to break up the puck. <laughs> Great job getting it out of the zone, but I'm not sure that's what you want him to do. No, absolutely not. <laughs> A little bit of a toe drag there, and I mean on the ice skate toe drag to not have an offsides yeah. occur. And that's a play that sometimes happens late in the third period when you're tired, not always thinking out there. Early in the game, usually that doesn't happen. Yeah, it reminds me like dribbling through a press in basketball. You know, pass your way through it. Don't dribble. He dribbled right up the lane. <laughs> a lot of risk if you lose the puck right there. And it's not like you're playing against the normal Chicago Bulldogs, Chicago Blues. Everybody's an all-star. Yeah, right. So you lose that puck at point-blank range right in the slot. It's almost game over for your goalie. Right, plus you've got people who are better at sniping the, the puck away. What do you want to do here if you're red? Maintain the forecheck or play for overtime? I, I think both teams uh, you just play the same way you've been playing. Don't, don't overemphasize defense or offense, although here's uh, nice kind pass of a three out on front, two. Try to split through the D, loose puck. And still in the slot, German stolen away. Out in front now, blue off the pad. And good job by Red, just yeah, icing. Just get it out of here. They're just tired. You got to get new players. Oh, it didn't oh go my back. goodness! <laughs> that is excellent officiating, by yes, the way. Yes. Here, here we, we go. go, two on O. Oh. Good pass right on the stride. That shot goes wide. Shot it wide. German couldn't get it on net. That might have been. Well, I don't know because it's been a long time since we got a Zamboni, but. How many times have we watched, and I'll say I've watched hockey in my life, and I've never seen the puck take a U-turn. He's offside, there it yeah. is. Yeah, I've never seen the puck take a U-turn like two inches away <laughs> from that little red line at the goal, at the goal mouth, wow. Here's What's the replay, the they're gonna show it. <laughs> yeah. Make a right turn. It looked like it a hit a divot right. in the ice. Yep, <laughs> what a great job on the replay. Excellent officiating, you know. Well, excellent TD in back there, yeah, too, from yeah. the steel crew. You know, sometimes we rag on officials, but they, no, there's no, a lot we're, of them who are very good at we're it. We're going to say sometimes you rag on the officials. I never say they do anything wrong. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Pass the blue line, Phillips. Nice move by Phillips. He still has it. He's behind Simpson. Good D. You know, we do the three stars in the game. I mean, you, you, you got to think Dane Simpson's going to be one of those three stars. It's so tough. That shot blocked, and good job by Pope blocking it. Three stars out of the All-Star game. I think that goal Dawes, by Feinstein was fabulous. Yeah, Dawes, I would have to say, you know, qualifies. He's got three assists, been playing terrific defense. And, of course, he was the last minute to add on, right? Maybe we need to get rid of those board of directors. They made the wrong call. He should have been starting at in the first place. It's hard to select the right people. I, I don't know what the process is necessarily. The board of directors, coaches, how much input they have, favorites. You know, if you're at the top of the standings, how do you pick? But from where I sit, they pick some pretty good players here. Wow, three assists. And there's only six total assists for Red today. Cook with it. Cook, his pass. He was trying to feed it over to Walkoff. And Red will ice. Minute to go. Well, maybe and a heroes are have not yet been born for this game. I mean, Dawes clearly should be one of the three stars, at least in my opinion. But somewhere along the way, there's going to be a winning goal by somebody. Maybe a couple of shootout goals. I mean, honorable mention: Dewey Rogers with two assists today. Yeah. Then you know the goalies are going to make X amount of saves, and you know that warrants something. Honorable mention: the red line. Remember in the second period when that puck somehow didn't go past the end line. <laughs> Make it three nothing. Maybe they need to take the end line out for a steak dinner. Does uh, blue team? Here's some speed. Falling to the ice. That shot. Ouch. Oh my goodness! Shroud got it, getting a piece of that with his skate as he was down on the ice. This is an exhibition game, but don't tell either players on both teams that they're. This feels like game seven of the Stanley Cup final. I gotta believe this is one of their favorite games they've ever played. You know, they have the whole season. Maybe they get in the playoffs, right? But. Chance for Red. Oh, he couldn't get it on net. 
what do you got to do to score on this guy? Out behind the net, if you're blue, I think just get it out, even ice it if you have to. Oh, play this for point, overtime. 27 seconds to go in the period. Yeah, get it out of the period. Uh, that's not the period. Get it out of the period. Well, yeah, get it out there. of the zone so you can get out of this period. Right. Oh, the bouncy puck. We need the Zamboni. Last chance for blue. If you're red, I think just ice it. Don't even play around with it. Well, what I like is both teams play to the whistles. Or the Behind horn. The net <laughs> to the corner and some tie-up action. And that will do it for the period. We are going to have overtime hockey, partner. How fun. Two overtime games in a row. So are we hoping somebody scores in overtime? I hope not. I want to see this shootout. Well, but it's fun to watch three-on-three -three hockey. Ugh, man, just couldn't get that shot on net by Justin Pappen. We'll take a break. It's three to three. Three on three coming up next. Three three game. This is what you signed up for as a fan, as a player, as a coach. Unless you're one of the parents on one of the teams, then you were hoping for a six nothing shutout, right? Six just, nothing running clock. Well, six nothing shutout anyway. So my favorite name, Kelby Veers, but let's make him one of the stars of the game. So we'll we'll project him to somehow do something magical in the in the overtime. Bad news if you're a fan of red team. Dane Simpson's going back on the ice in that 1.88 GAA during the postseason is rearing its ugly head against the members of Red Team. Yeah, that .36 improvement yeah, over the other goalie, right? Good idea, though. He's been resting for a while. I think it's a good call by the coaching staff. Our interviewee, Cook, taking the first face-off. And face he won the face-off. by Blue, yeah, over yeah. to Stark. Well, partner, what changes on three-on-three -three besides, of course, the ice opening up? Oh, my gosh. Hold the puck. Turnovers matter. Five-on-five -five turnovers don't matter as much because it's still hard to score five-on-four or five, four-on-five, whatever. But here, three-on-three, -three, everything then becomes an odd man break. Three-on-two, two-on-one. So possession is everything. Even if you got to take the puck back out of the zone, don't lose the puck. Here's a chance for Blue. Great job by Red to avoid here, the rebound. Red's got a two on one. Got to hustle, though. D'Souza with some moves. What a great, great job with the poke check. But Mirzwa able to get it. Mirzwa, man, there's so many divots on the ice tonight, it seems mm -hmm. like. Mirzwa with a nice move. Back over the faceoff circle. We have no idea where the puck's going to go. Mirzwa. Mirzwa with a nice move. Mirzwa now we lost, lost it. Right, and that's what you can't do. You lost the puck, not even a shot. So possession is everything in, the, in these overtimes. Four minutes to go, Blue has the puck. Stark taking his time, and you can now, now that it's three on three. Stark tied up on the boards. Blue able to keep it in. Shot, oh, he's wide open in front pass. And Takes scores. him out, he scores! Ryan Cook with the game winner. He was wide open. He could have read a book how open he was in front of the net. Makes me want to replay the interview that we had to see if he had a premonition that he was going to be the winning goal at the end. So we spoke to him before the game. So the question is, should we speak to him again after the game? But credit the pass. And I believe it was delivered by Quinn Walcott. It looked like it was going to be a shot all the way, but it turned out to be a saucer pass. Ryan Cook with the goal. Let's do our three stars of the game, brought to you by Plato's Closet. What are your three stars, partner? Well, Ryan Cook has to be one of them. I still think you include Dylan Dawes in there. And then, you know, I'm open on that third player, but, you know, probably from the blue team, we have to start thinking about that. I, I guess um, Menisco might be a good sh uh, a shot. You know, five goals, took ten face-offs. Uh, five assists, I'm sorry, took ten face-offs. I think I might go with Menisco. All right, partner, if I had to do my three stars, you got to do Ryan Cook, he has the game winner. Dane Simpson and Dylan Dawes, wasn't even supposed to play in this game. He's an injury replacement, three assists, had an excellent game, just not enough offense for red team today. Yeah, picking Simpson, you can't go wrong with that. Good goalie. All right, we'll do our, our post-game interview. We'll let Seth choose, but it might be Dane Simpson. Stay with us, post-game interview slash post-game show coming up next.
2010. Game 6 of the Stanley Cup Final is taking place between the Chicago Blackhawks and the Philadelphia Flyers. They'll still have to win a Game 7 in Chicago. It's a 3-3 tie in the first overtime, meaning this has been a moderate offensive explosion with some decent defense and goaltending squeeze in between this hockey contest. This is a huge game for Blackhawks fans as their favorite hockey team has been a laughing stock in the Western Conference for most of the previous decade. For the Flyers, they're looking to bring back Stanley Cup glory to the city of brotherly love for the first time since the 1970s. To truly understand the importance of what happens next, we need to hit that left button on the VCR. In other words, we need to rewind. The Blackhawks are an overtime goal away from cementing their legacy in NHL history. But for a franchise who used to not even televise its home games, this seemed like a pipe dream even five years ago. Known for his severe cheapness, Blackhawks former owner Bill Wirtz decided to cancel all home broadcast agreements with network and cable television outlets in 1992. According to Wirtz and the Wirtz Corporation as a whole, home broadcasts were, quote, unfair to the team's season ticket holders, unquote. And as crazy as this decision was by Wirtz, fan attendance increased during the mid-1990s. Incredibly, without normal home broadcasts and overall television brand awareness about the team, the Hawks averaged over 19,300 fans during the mid-1990s at the United Center. This is how it worked. WGN and other media outlets couldn't broadcast the Blackhawks games at the United Center. But if a national broadcasting network such as ESPN decided to telecast the game, a Blackhawk fan could purchase Hawk Vision, a subscription network worth $29.99 per month. Then you could watch the ESPN broadcast of Blackhawks vs. Red Wings at the United Center on normal cable television. It was pretty confusing to be sure, and as you know, the internet wasn't big back then. If you were a big hockey fan and wanted to know about the Blackhawks, you either had to go to the game or wait for the hockey highlight on SportsCenter. Even then, hockey coverage wasn't big on ESPN, so it was in your best interest to purchase a ticket at the UC. So the fans kept supporting the Blackhawks even though they couldn't watch their favorite team on TV. However, the product on the ice wasn't so great. As if it were a curse from the hockey gods, the Hawks kept finding different ways to choke in the playoffs. An original six team, the Hawks were at one time the second most cursed original six franchise. The New York Rangers went titleless from 1940 until 1994, and the Hawks now find themselves in the same place as the Toronto Maple Leafs. The Maple Leafs and the Hawks have not hoisted Lord Stanley's Cup since the 1960s decade. For the Hawks, it's been even worse. They haven't won it all since 1961, and before that, Chicago went 23 years without hoisting the Cup. The Maple Leafs have been a borderline disaster since 1967, but at least the Leafs were a dynasty in the 60s. The Hawks were lucky to even win the 1961 Stanley Cup. So yeah, the Hawks have pretty much been mediocre or worse since 1961. However, there were moments when the franchise seemed destined for championship glory. The worst moment for Chicago hockey fans was the 1971 Stanley Cup Final against the hated Montreal Canadiens. Without air conditioning at Old Chicago Stadium, the Hawks were the home team during Game 7 of the Finals against the Canadiens. Jumping out to an early 2-0 lead, legendary netminder Tony Esposito couldn't stop Jock Lamar's 60-foot away snapshot, giving the Canadians their first goal of the contest. Chicago Tribune writer Bob Verde said there was a humid haze hung over the ice, but Esposito refused to blame the rink's lack of air conditioning on the soft goal he gave up. He had a point since Lamar's shot was nearly from the center line. The Canadians never looked back and scored twice more to upset the Hawks and win 3-2 on Chicago's home ice. Since then, the Hawks have never been closer to winning the Cup as they were that day in 1971. That is, until tonight anyway. As painful as it was in 1971, Hawks fans who were still alive in 1992 had to be devastated at what happened next at Belfour and Dominic Hasek. Incredibly, Eddie the Eagle, Belfour, and Dominic the Dominator Hasek were both on the Blackhawks at the same time. Two future Hall of Fame goalies were both on the Hawks, and yet the franchise still couldn't win a Stanley Cup with either netminder. Belfour was the starter during the brief Belfour Hasek years. The Hawks made the 1992 Stanley Cup championship round with Belfour and Hasek both on the roster. It was also a Chicago team with Chris Chalios leading the defenseman and forward Jeremy Roenick was on this Hawks team as well. Led by captain Dirk Graham, the Hawks went on a very impressive winning streak in the playoffs. After falling to a 2-1 series deficit to the St. Louis Blues, the Hawks won their next three games against the Blues, as well as back-to-back -back series sweeps against the Detroit Red Rings and the Edmonton Oilers. Just like that, 11 consecutive victories saw the Blackhawks four wins away from ending up as the last team standing. The only team in their proverbial way 
the NHL's version of the Super Mario Brothers, otherwise known as Mario Lemieux and Yammer Yager. The Pittsburgh Penguins were the defending cup champions, and after nearly beating the Washington Capitals in Game 7 during Round 1, the Pens found their way in the finals thanks to winning 8 of their last 10 games. Hasek was probably Chicago's better goalie entering the playoffs, as the Dominator earned all rookie honors and went 10-4-1 during his 15 starts between the pipes. Between a contract holdout from Belfort and Crazy Eddie missing games this season due to personal reasons, Hasek was turning into a fan favorite, while Belfort was the more controversial choice in net. However, head coach and general manager Mike Keenan stuck with Belfort throughout the playoffs. He turned out to be the best cold ender in the postseason not named Tom Barrasso. The problem is Barrasso plays for Pittsburgh, so it was up to Roenick and company to find consistent offense against the Eastern Conference's best goalie. It looked like the Hawks had the Pens right where they wanted them when they took a 4-1 lead during Game 1. But the hockey gods haven't liked Chicago since 1961. Whenever the Hawks can blow a postseason lead during crunch time, they like to do it. The Pens scored four unanswered goals on their home ice, including the game winner with just 13 seconds left in OT. A crushing 5-4 loss for the Hawks, and they never rebounded from it. It was a sweep for the Pens as the Penguins celebrated their championship victory at Chicago Stadium. Hasek even showed during the series that he still had some raw rookie moments, but Belfair clearly wasn't himself. Hasek subbed in for Belfour in Game 4 after Eddie the Eagle gave up two goals on just four shots on goal. Keenan had a tough decision to make between keeping Hasek and Belfour, but with Belfour one year removed from winning the Vezina and Williams M. Jennings trophies for best goalie, Keenan had no choice but to allow Hasek to become expendable. The Sabres then cashed on the young goalie's athleticism by fleecing the Hawks with a terrible trade request. The Sabres received a future Hall of Famer in Hasek, and the Blackhawks received just future draft considerations and a goalie in Stefan Beauregard, who never played a single minute in the goalie crease. The future draft considerations eventually led to the Hawks drafting Eric Daze in the fourth round. Daze became an all-star left winger, but serious back and herniated disc issues saw the team's promising winger limited to just 74 games in three seasons after his all-star game appearance in 2002. He retired after playing just one game in 2005. That being said, Keenan didn't want there to be a locker room controversy between Hasek and Belfour, and it's easy to say in hindsight when no one knew how great Hasek would become. Unfortunately, Belfour wouldn't even finish his career in Chicago. The Hawks were worried that he wouldn't resign with the team, so they shipped him off to San Jose for three players I personally never heard of until I googled them. Ulf Dahlin, Michael Sikora, and Chris Terreri. Terreri was put in a very tough position of trying to fill Belfour's shoes in net. He never got close to reaching Belfour's milestone achievements. Blackhawk fans kept asking themselves, is this team curse? The 1999 Stanley Cup Final pitted Belfour against Hasek as the Dallas Stars took on the Buffalo Sabres. Belfour eventually won the cup over Hasek in the series, although Hasek won more cups than the Eagle once he began playing for the Red Wings. The Blackhawks managed just one more Western Conference Finals appearance with Belfort Net, and they wouldn't get back to the Western Conference Finals until last season. No one ever wishes someone to die, but success seemed to reach the Blackhawks once Bill Wirtz passed away from complications of cancer on September 26, 2007. His son, Rocky Wirtz, took over the team, and during their first season with Rocky as the CEO, the Hawks finished above 500 for the first time in six years. With John McDonough as the president and Joel Quenville as the head coach, the Hawks made it back to the playoffs and finished in the Final Four. The Red Wings once again got in their way and easily took care of the Hawks four games to one during the 2009 Western Conference Finals. Entering the 2009-10 season, the Hawks decided they need a veteran forward who could score goals and match up against their biggest rival, the Detroit Red Wings. Marion Hossa signed with the Blackhawks, giving the Hawks a formidable 1-2-3 punch on line one on Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves, Marion Hossa. That is, if they ever needed to use all three guys on the power play. The Hawks were a tough team to beat in 2010, and they finished just one point shy of the Western Conference leading Sharks, but the Hawks were the better team in the Western Conference Finals and swept the Sharks to make it to the Stanley Cup Final. Their opponent was an unlikely one, the Philadelphia Flyers. Entering the playoffs as a seventh seed, the Flyers had little title aspirations, but after the top-seeded Capitals were stunned in round one to the eighth-seeded Canadians, there was new hope in Philly. The Flyers looked dead in the water when they trailed three games to zero in the Eastern Conference semifinals. But Simone Gagne returned for game four, and they definitely needed him as Gagne scored in overtime to force a game five. Brian Boucher was excellent as the Flyers' starting goalie during Game 5, but he had to leave the game early due to knee injuries. 
As such, Michael Layton finished off game five as the Flyers' new goalie and preserved the 4-0 shutout. Layton then got the start in game six as expected, and he made the most of his opportunity by being perfect through 59 minutes until the Boston Bruins scored late. It was still a 2-1 win for the Flyers, and wouldn't you know it, the Flyers had a chance to win game seven and come back from an insurmountable 3-0 deficit. The Bruins actually led 3-0 in Game 7 at the TD Garden in Boston, but they simply couldn't avoid a significantly embarrassing collapse. James Van Riemsdyk, who didn't score a single goal in the playoffs prior to tonight, then had a very important goal late in the first period to give his teammates new life and ending the shutout attempt. The Flyers then scored three more unanswered goals to win a surprising 4-3 Game 7 over the Bruins, becoming just the third team in NHL history to come back from a 3-0 series deficit. In fact, this had only been done once in any other American professional sport besides hockey. The Boston Red Sox defeated the New York Yankees four games to three during the 2004 American League Championship Series. And now the Flyers are back in the Stanley Cup Final for the first time since 1997, looking for their first championship since 1975. The 1997 Stanley Cup Final was very interesting since it pitted the Flyers against the Red Wings with both teams being in the Eastern Time Zone. The Flyers got swept in that series with fans questioning if the franchise made the right decision all those years ago when they traded for former number one overall draft pick Eric Lindros. Lindros scored just once in that series against the Red Wings and it cost the Flyers a lot just to acquire him. They sent the Quebec Nordique six players, two first round picks and $15 million in cash for only Lindros. The Nordiques eventually moved to Colorado with the future Hall of Famer in Forsberg helping the Colorado Avalanche win two Stanley Cup titles. What did Lindros contribute? Just one goal in his lone Stanley Cup final and his constant bad luck of suffering concussions, he suffered four during his career in Philly, inevitably led to him being traded to the New York Rangers. In a weird twist of fate, the Rangers tried to trade for Lindros, which would have included goalie Mike Richter. Richter was huge down the stretch for the Rangers during the 1994 Stanley Cup Final, which they won, so Rangers fans are probably very happy with the trade with Philly that was finalized prior to the Rangers calling up the Nordiques. But the Flyers are finally back in the Stanley Cup Final, in large part due to the Flyers getting defenseman Chris Pronger in another blockbuster deal with Anaheim. It cost Philly two players and two first round picks. History tells us that the Flyers love sacrificing the future for winning now, but this time around, it has paid its dividends in a big way. Pronger's 14 playoffs assists have allowed the Flyers to be one goal away from forcing a Game 7 in Chicago, their closest to a title in 35 years. The trade for Pronger was definitely an immediate success. Layton's three shutouts in the Eastern Conference Finals proved that he deserves to be in the league, but is he a franchise goalie? Not so much. One of the reasons that the Blackhawks are a goal away from the title is Layton can't recreate his magic from the previous round. In fact, Boucher relieved him in Game 2 and Game 5 due to erratic play, but head coach Peter LaViolette decided to stick with Layton in this pivotal Game 6. And to be honest, the Flyers felt comfortable about tonight. Both of their wins in the series were at home, and with the Hawks being led by two players under the age of 25 in Kane and Taves, they don't have a lot of experience in this pressure situation. It's up to former number one overall draft pick Patrick Kane and Captain Taves to finish off the Flyers. Otherwise, it's back to Chicago for a winner go home game seven, and Blackhawk fans know all too well how that panned out back in 71. Sharp knows all too well how this Blackhawks team has stunk over the years as he joined the team during the 2006 season. And remind their fans of Broad Street Bullies who won back-to-back -back cups in the 70s. Or will the Blackhawks finally appease the hockey gods and give their fans a much-deserved championship? It's golden goal format and Patrick Kane has the puck deep in the Flyers' end. Welcome. Thanks for watching our NHL version of Rewinder. Make sure to comment below and subscribe to Sports Broadcast Solutions.